we are launching off with um, a filmmaker, Melanie McLaughlin, who I've known for a few years and who has been working in the documentary industry and as an independent filmmaker for over 20 years. She um, has worked for a number of stations that you may have heard of, like HBO and Showtime and PBS, and she, in 2007, won a National Emmy for Investigative Journalism for her documentary, Have You Seen Andy? Um, she is here today to show us some of her more recent work and to talk about an aspect of streaming culture that you may not have given a lot of thought to, which is culture and representation of people with disabilities on film and how personal documentary and other film can be used to dispel stereotypes about this particular community. So without any further ado, I'd like to welcome Melanie McLaughlin. I'm sure you're all just sort of waking up with your coffee at this point, right? Um, thank you for having me. So as Marlon said, Melanie uh, Perkins McLaughlin, and I uh, was a communications major myself. I like to share a little bit of my own personal story. I think it's important to remember that we all have a story to tell. We all have numerous stories to tell, and we never know what the person beside us has to tell in terms of their story. So I would encourage you. Um, during the course of the time that I'm going to be speaking today, we'll take a little few minutes and do a turn and talk, and maybe we can share a little bit of our own story with each other. Um, so story is personal narrative is sort of one of the points that I want to start with. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about me. Um, I am from Lawrence, Massachusetts. I grew up in Lawrence. Lawrence, uh, for those of you who, who don't know, is the 23rd poorest city in the country. I grew up in a housing project in Lawrence, and um, I lived there from preschool through pretty much freshman year in high school. When I was uh, nine years old, I, the housing project had about three or four hundred kids, so it was actually a great place to live. We could have a game of you know hide and go seek or relievio or tag at any moment. We were allowed to go outside until the lights came on and you know come uh, come back inside. And, but we always had friends there, and we always had people to play with uh, night or day. One particular summer, August um, of 1976, we were excited to go to the swimming pool across the street. One of the things about our housing projects, there were four housing projects in the city. Our housing project was the stadium project. And one of the great things about the stadium was that it was right across the street from an uh, MDC pool, swimming pool. So we had our own swimming pool. It was sort of like our own personal vacation. And then on the other side, we had the Lawrence Stadium, which was where all the football games would be and sort of you know, annual events through the year and stuff. So we were sort of right in the center of, of the hub of the city. And on August 21st, 1976, I woke up. I was nine years old. It was particularly hot. And I was excited to go over to the pool, which I pretty much did every day that summer. And I went over to the pool with my brother, who's just 12 months older than me. And um, all our friends were there. And among them was my brother's friend, Andy, who had moved to the projects that summer um, in March of that year. And I had developed a crush on Andy. I am the youngest with three older brothers, and I'm the only girl. And uh, so often they wouldn't want to include me in their games or activities. And Andy insisted that I be included. And right away, I had a crush on him. And so we called each other boyfriend and girlfriend that summer, which you know essentially meant that we liked each other. Um, and we went to the pool that day, and, and you know it was so hot that the second you got out of the pool, you wanted to jump back in. The cement would burn your feet. Um, and so we really just were playing. And around 2 o'clock, I started to, to feel hungry, and I wanted to go home. And I asked Andy if he would walk me home. And to this day, I don't know why I asked him that, because normally I would walk home by myself. This day, I didn't want to. I asked Andy to walk me home, and he wanted to stay at the pool. I asked my brother to walk me home, and he wanted to stay at the pool. I sort of stormed off, and my brother decided he better catch up with me or else he would get in trouble with mom. So he caught up with me, and we went home that day. And Andy never came home. Um, that, e that night, uh, actually about the next day, about 3 o'clock in the morning, we were uh, woken by police officers banging on our door. Our mother took us out of our bed and asked us when the last time was that we had seen Andy. And so I shared the story that I just shared with you. I had left him. He was sitting underneath an overhang um, in the pool. And we said goodbye. And we never saw him again. Suddenly, within probably 24 hours, the housing project was inundated 
with helicopters and National Guard officers. And, um, a whole station, CB station was set up at the stadium. People were calling Andy's names, and the adults just looked so scared, and the kids were participating in the search. We were going into the woods to look for him. We were looking all around the city for him. And after six days, the search ended with no explanation. I was nine years old. I stood out in that housing project, and I remembered that when I thought, when I grew up, someday, I'm going to try to find Andy. I couldn't understand why the search had stopped. I couldn't understand where he could be. So fast forward, I leave Lawrence, I enter um, Fitchburg State, I went to Fitchburg State. I was gonna be a human services major. I was a human services major. I was gonna be a social worker, do direct care services. My senior year of graduating, first semester senior year, I see fil students filming out on the quad, and I, I had this crisis of con con conscience. All of a sudden I thought, I want to be a documentary film. I want to be a filmmaker. I don't want to do human services. I went to my advisor. I said, what am I going to do? I have one semester left, and I want to change my major. <laughs> and she said, uh, you can take up, keep your major, pick up the communications major. You know, you've already done all your core classes, your liberal classes. Take the second major, double major, human services, communications, and make social justice films. And I thought, OK. That's what I'll do. So I spent a, a little more time there, and when I graduated from Fitchburg, I interned with uh, PBS, so WGBH. And my first job was with Nova. And I remember my first shoot. I was on um, a boat in Sarasota, Florida, helping our producer, as a production assistant, helping our producer film marine biologists capturing wild dolphins in Sarasota Bay and uh, collecting information on them. And I thought, wow, you know, this is the right job for me. It was great. And, um, and from then there on, there on, I worked on project to project. So I was a project contract production assistant, started out as an intern, then a production assistant, and I would work on other people's projects. So I worked on films, you know, about dolphins, Wright Brothers, Amelia Earhart. Um, at that point, we started to get some direct competition from stations that you guys are really familiar with now, but believe it or not, back then didn't exist. They're not actually that old. Um, Discovery Channel and the History Channel started up. So we got some projects with Discovery Channel. I got to work on a four-part series about dreams. You know, one of the best parts of working in documentary filmmaking was that I could read these books about the subject dreams and then I could find the experts as a researcher and then we would go out and film these experts so we could actually ask the experts sort of their opinion as we filmed them and figured out um, what our storyline was and what our through line was and um, some those were really great you know we did a series on dreams with uh, celebrities who dream their art so William Styron uh, or draw their art or write their art so William Styron and um, uh, Isabella Allende, Billy Joel, I got to hang out with him. I had lots of fun in those production years. Um, but after about probably 15 years of working on other people's films, I decided it was time to tell my own story, or a story. And as a filmmaker, I knew from what I had seen with everybody else that I had, whose projects I worked on, that if I wanted to make my own film, it was going to have to be about something that kept me up at night. It was going to have to be that story that was so deep in my belly that I had to tell it, and I knew I had to tell it some way or another. So hopefully some of you here have that story deep in your belly, and you can think about what that is, and that's the story you should tell. So I decided it was time to make my own film, and I was going to make... So I thought long and hard about what that story was. I had one or two that sort of were that compelling to me, and certainly um, Andy and his story was chief among them. I felt very compelled. Um, to go back and find out what happened to him. So I very naively just started to research um, Andy's disappearance. And I had done a lot of research as a production assistant and now associate producer. And so in my research, I started doing what you all do for research right here in the school, right? You start reading books about the topic, so missing children. Um, you start looking at who the national organizations are working on the issue. Maybe you start building some databases around who the main characters are or who the characters are, contact information, um, notes that you get as you start doing phone interviews with these uh, direct sources, and you start to, to, to find your story. You start to feel out what the arc of the story is. So one of the most important things, I think, to remember is a story, right? It sounds very naive, but it's uh, uh, very uh, simple, but it's very true. A story has three really important elements. A beginning, a middle, and an end. 
okay? And you can tell a story in long form feature documentary, like I told in Have You Seen Andy? Or you can tell it in a more short form, which I'll show you in a little while about celebrating differences in, in diversity and sort of how that works. But they all have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And in the middle, you have some conflict. conflict and in the end, you have some resolution. All, every story you ever see is gonna have that same formula. So you think about that when you're framing your own story as communication majors. So I'm going to share just sort of, um, <coughs> hang on, sorry. So, um, Have You Seen Andy? Um, is haveyouseenandy.com. That was the uh, documentary I did about the disappearance of my childhood friend. So after I started building research, I decided to open a P.O. box and I decided to go get some publicity to see if I could get tips to the P.O. box to find out because the case had been 1976. It was now, you know, almost uh, 20 years after his disappearance. We needed some new information and fresh tips. We opened a P.O. box, went to the media. The media and Lawrence, the Lawrence Eagle Tribune, ran a story. Suddenly we had tips flooding the, the P.O. box. And then we decided to go to the Boston Globe um, to ha expand that viewership to see if we could get more tips, see if we could get more leads. And then once we went to the Boston Globe, the Globe decided to follow me for six months while I was making the film very early. And there's an eight-part series on the website where you can see how the Globe followed me while I was making the documentary. You can read those stories. But once the Globe uh, series came out, it was an eight-part series in the um, Globe that ran daily with a cliffhanger at the end, by probably story number five or story number six, ABC News, Dateline, CBS, Oprah, everybody was calling me, wanting this story. Um, and I was, you know, not that far out of college. It sounded really exciting. It was really enticing to have all these big networks calling and sort of, you know, asking me about the story. And when they came to, to sort of research whether they wanted to do this film or take this story themselves, um, they decided it was a great story and they really did want to do it. But what they wanted to do was to take my tapes, my footage, and go back to New York or California or wherever else and do the story themselves and then let me know when it was done. And even though um, they were you know, great big networks and it was a really great opportunity, I really knew that this was a story that I had to tell. So I deferred and did not do that. I worked for eight years off and on on other people's projects while I saved money to be able to use little bits of money to do shooting, filming, move the story forward, you know, do as much as I could to get the story um, moved forward. And so um, I hired an editor, and uh, we put together a rough cut for the film. And in 2007, HBO picked up the film. Um, it was a feature-length documentary. And uh, in, the, in the theater that Andy and I used to go to as children, we had this huge uh, uh, opening night where all of our friends from you know, the pool, uh, from the projects, from college, advisors, teachers, you know, all these people from my life were in the audience, over 400 people. And um, we were, I was about to share this story, but it wasn't just my story, and I knew it wasn't just my story. It was this shared story of childhood trauma and uh, that all of us had experienced. And I was going to be able to tell it from the children's perspective for the first time since Andy had disappeared. It was a pretty momentous event. And I looked out at this audience and I thought, wow, you know, what in the world am I gonna do next that feels this meaningful? And I would find out. I was eight weeks pregnant with our third child, who we would learn had Down syndrome and a congenital heart defect. So I was, the universe sort of gave me my answer. Um, and in 2008, uh, after she was born and her heart surgery um, went successfully, I got a phone call. I was actually in the car on the way to Water Country with three kids. Um, and I got a phone call from HBO that said uh, they had nominated Have You Seen Andy for an Emmy. And um, it had been chosen for the Emmy Awards and that um, they wanted to know if I could come to New York City and they could send her for the Emmy. And um, I was very excited. It was really unexpected. I didn't even know they were submitting the film. And, uh, and then I got off the phone with them and I told all my children and they said, that's great, Mom, how much longer to Water Country? Uh, so it put it all in perspective, which was pretty funny. And I uh, went to Lincoln Center in 08, and the film won um, uh, Best Investigative Journalism. It won the Emmy for Best Investigative Journalism. So the validation of that experience, that very personal experience of a nine-year-old girl who was with her childhood friend who vanished that day, you know, being able to share the story of these children who had been traumatized, but then also being recognized and validated for the investigative work that perhaps should have happened on Andy's behalf, you know, all those many years and, and hadn't, was 
so rewarding and much more so because it was a story that had lived inside of me all those years. So I encourage you, you know, really think about those stories for yourselves. So after Gracie was born, um, I knew that I would, I, I was suddenly thrust into this world that I had never been exposed to, which is the world of disability, right? So I had grown up certainly a marginalized kid in a housing project, um, but I had not experienced disability for the most part. I didn't really know folks with disability. Um, I remember in my, in my uh, middle school years, suddenly there was a trailer out back where I would see kids with disabilities that would be in the trailer, but they would not necessarily be in my classroom. Um, they sort of suddenly just seemed to appear, but then uh, also were very much segregated from, from us. And, um, so I had no real experience. And then Gracie was born, and suddenly I learned very quickly that she was among the most marginalized communities. Because not only was she a person with a disability, not only is she a person with a disability, she's a person with an intellectual disability. So especially in this culture where we pride intelligence, and um, oftentimes people think it's a marker of who we are, um, she suddenly was uh, on the lowest of the low. Uh, in terms of where we are on the scale of, you know, life valued. Um, and the social justice person, filmmaker in me certainly came out, but so did the mom. And I started to think about how can I share these stories? How can I share the humanity of who these people are that I'm really experiencing and getting to know? And I did not come to it myself in a way that I didn't have experience with people dis with disability, but when I took her into the Children's Hospital for her open heart surgery at two months old. And I had to hand her over to the anesthesiologist. And I knew very well that I might not be getting her back. And I knew very well that a few months before, I wasn't even sure I really wanted her in our life because of the fear. Um, I suddenly was woke, woke to this idea. Um, and I spent a week in that cardiac unit and I saw other babies who passed away, not babies with Down syndrome, typically developing babies who happen to have a heart defect. And I thought, you know, I'm gonna leave this hospital with my baby and I'm fortunate enough to do that and I'm never going to look back at why she may be different from other people. In fact, I'm gonna celebrate her differences and I'm gonna do everything I can to help other people do the same. So I uh, got a fellowship at an organization called the Institute for Community, at an organization called the Institute for Community Inclusion I'm going to take this off at an organization called the Institute for Community Inclusion. And um, it was a year long fellowship um, celebrating uh, on, in neurodevelopmental disability and uh, leadership. And it had a project to apply for the, for the disability, you have to have a project. So I thought, <clears throat> I certainly am going to make a film. I'm a filmmaker, but what will I make the film about? I only have a year. How do I do this? And so I started to look out at the community and see where there might be stories that already existed. And the National Down Syndrome Society had a website campaign that was a My Great Story collection. And they had solicited stories from the country of people asking tell, you know, to for them to tell their story. So there were over probably 300 stories banked there in written form. And so I thought, well, these stories are here. I can look at the scope of my budget. How much can I afford? How much time do I have to do the project? What will it look like? And I decided to choose 10 stories from that bank of 300. Mostly the choices were based on region. I tried to stay in the Northeast region because of budgeting um, restrictions. Um, and then I also tried to d diversify uh, the stories of Hmong. And then I tried to think back to before I had a child with disability, what were my, some of my misconceptions about people with disability and how could I address those. So we worked through those stories. We you know, started off, I think, with 50, honed it down to 25, got down to 10. And so we started the My Great Story um, video project as part of this fellowship. Now, most of you probably, the, the teachers here will know who Chris Burke is, but um, most of the students won't. Chris Burke is an actor who was in a, he was the first actor with Down syndrome to be in a primetime television show. He was in a television show called Life Goes On. 
um, in the late 70s, I think early 80s, and it was not so much featured around his Down syndrome. He was a member of the family. He did have Down syndrome. There were certainly stories about Down syndrome and how it affected him and his family, but it was more a story of family than anything else. But um, more importantly, he really broke stereotypes by being able to be an actor and a, a lead actor in a primetime series. So um, Chris is an ambassador for the National Down Syndrome Society. I had worked on History Channel and Discovery Channel projects before, and I wanted to package these stories so that they always had had the same beginning and the same ending so that they could sensibly take the other 490 or uh, 290 stories that were out there in video and make more of them if they wanted to, right? They could always bookend it with the beginning and an end. That's packaging. So that it always looks the same, but you put your story in the middle. So I packaged it, we packaged it with Chris um, on either end, and here is one of my great stories. So you'll notice, I want you to pay attention to these, if you will, in that they're three minutes long. They're all three minutes long, so that's the other thing about packaging. You have to be consistent in the, in the way that it's packaged, right? So that you can edit quickly into the, into the middle. Um, and they're all three minutes long. They all have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And they all have some dramatic uh, element or conflict. So this story is um, One Sibling's Act Leads to Change. That doesn't look like this is what it is. Hold on. Hi, my sorry, I don't know why we put those up ahead of time. Let me try another one. Dan, are you here? Let's try sis sister's expectations. Hi, I'm Chris Berg, an actor who happens to have Down syndrome. You might know me as Quirky from Life Goes On. That's just part of my story. I think everyone has a great story. Join me in watching this great story about an inspiring person with Down syndrome. Serena is 44 years old. Serena and I are about a year and three days apart. She's my older sister, although she tells everyone she's my younger sister. She designed a game, um, which was I copy you now, sister. Huh, yeah. Everything I did, she copied, which was a great learning tool for her. When I was 17, I moved away from Gloucester to Las Vegas to go to school. Serena wanted to go out on her own, and my parents wouldn't let her cross the street by herself. I was going to school at the time for psychology and special ed, and thought I knew it all, so I took her. I took her to Las Vegas with me, with no plan. It was an impulsive 21-year-old thing to do. It was challenging. We had no services. We had no help. It was just the two of us. For the first time, she was home alone. So it was like a crash course in, in being independent. It was Halloween night, and we were going to a club. Someone ran a red light, and we just didn't see him. We just head on. It was pretty nasty. Serena had the gash in her throat and was bruised from head to toe. My knees were demolished with a fractured skull. It took care of each other. It was kind of cool to see that everything I had taught her, she used to help us both. I couldn't even pick up a shampoo bottle to or raise my hands to wash my hair. She had to do that. Um, and I had done it for her so many times that she knew exactly what to do. And then she would talk to me like I talked to her and say, oh, good job, and put your head back. Okay, I love that. Yeah. Uh, spaghetti and sauce. I love that. It was interesting to see her turn that incredibly negative event in her life into something so positive for herself. And it was because of her, and I would have still been stuck in some sort of misery, I think, if I didn't have my sister pull me out of it. I wrote a book, For the Love. I wanted people to, my sister, 
as as I did. So it was it was very um, it was awesome to see people writing me letters and saying what an inspiration my sister was to them. I think she has more abilities than I do. Just to emit this incredible love that everybody was drawn to. And just to be so happy all the time, not all the time, but most of the time, <laughs> was an ability that I didn't think too many people possessed. I love her. <laughs> Good. Thank you. I love her. <laughs> my name is Gina. My name is Serena. And this is my great story. Oh, great story. <laughs> <laughs> You can watch more great stories at ndss.org slash stories. Yeah, if we can lower it a little bit, I don't know, is Dan able to do that? Dan, can you lower the audio a little bit for another one? Um, so I also think it'd be really interesting for, for folks here if at, you know after this if you want to start if you're thinking about story and storytelling you can go into the migrate story project and look at the text of this you know and see how I took that text of that story and turn it into the the filmmaking piece so it's a nice way to sort of look at you know just sort of a written thing that was not written for film um, but that we were able to take you know into the film piece so um, let's see what we have for this one different sneakers. Um, in, in light of busting stereotypes, actually I'll do different sneakers first and then we'll see. Each of these, um, they're three minutes but the packaging has the 54 seconds so that's just sort of the piece there. Hold on, this curtain's in my way. An actor who happens to have Tau syndrome. You might know me as quirky from Life Goes On. That's just part of my story. I think everyone has a great story. Join me in watching this great story about an inspiring person with Down syndrome. What kind of sneakers is she going to have to wear? This was one of many questions that went through my head. I was turning 17. The morning I found out, I actually took a pregnancy test and went to school. When I got pregnant, I, I thought of all the good things that I would do, that I would take her shopping with me at the mall and dress her up in cute clothes and new sneakers. I was so young. I was only thinking of the fun things. When I was 24 weeks pregnant, I found out that my baby might have Down syndrome. When I got the diagnosis of Down syndrome, I didn't think I would be able to take her shopping. I didn't, I thought she'd have to wear orthotics and beige shoes. I, I don't know. Those were the things that went through my mind. I wanted her to be stylish. I didn't want her to wear things that were comfortable, that didn't look cool. It was such a big deal. And it sounds so ridiculous, but that's the mindset I was in. They did a level two ultrasound. She had a hole in her heart. I wanted her to be okay. I wanted her to live more than anything. I just remember there were these little pair of crib shoes and they were so cute and they were pink and white. And I bought them anyways, because I figured, you know what? I don't care. She is going to wear those shoes. She got more wear out of them than a typical child because she had Down syndrome, because she was tiny. She grew so slowly. Everything she wore, she got more use out of. Jalen is eight years old. No matter where we go, everybody knows who she is. She's just amazing. Jalen's a great swimmer. She is great at riding horses. She has no fear. It's something she really excels at. Having a child with Down syndrome has changed my life. I started a body walk when she was a year old. A triple walk. A body walk, yes. 
and this is our eighth year. We have over 400 people that come to the walk, and it's just a great day to celebrate Down syndrome and celebrate our families. I also started delivering care packages to families that are in the hospital with a child with Down syndrome. We're called Harpies for Down Syndrome, and we visit between three and six families per month because it can be a hard and scary time. We still shop quite a bit. She has lots of sisters who like to shop too, but Jalen loves sparkly clothes and she's, she likes the fashion stuff. It's my story. It's my story. You can watch more of these stories at ndss.org slash stories. Okay, we have a few more, and then I have one thing that I want to show you that I'm working on now. But I want to take a moment. I'm going to ask um, Meryl if she wouldn't mind being a timekeeper. I want you to take three minutes, and I want you to, one of you to turn to someone next to you and tell a story about something that has inspired you in your life. It doesn't have to be the story deep down in your belly, because I know that one can be hard to tell, and that might take a little bit of time but maybe one that's a little bit higher up. Something that inspired you in your life, that made you either decide to take action or made you want to do something um, that you hadn't done yet and maybe you're still working on. So three minutes, starting now. Okay, so three minutes is up. Um, 
I wonder if you were able to get a beginning and a middle and an end in those three minutes, or if maybe you were able to find something out about somebody that you hadn't known before. And I just want you to remember, um, as I said, we all have uh, a story to tell, and, um, and we all should tell it in terms of connecting each other to our own humanity. The other piece is, um, I was just talking with Dan, because I had him tell me some story during that intro. And you know, um, one of the things that he brought up that I thought was really important to remember as well is that you know, filmmaking is like uh, riding a bike, you know, playing a sport, any of those things. You can write about it. You can write about riding a bike. You can talk about the bicycle, the wheels, everything else. But until you get on the bike and actually start to pedal, you're not going to know what it means to ride a bike, truly, right? So it's the same with filmmaking. You have to start. You have to do it. And if you don't think you can, you can't. Because nobody else is going to think you can. So the point is you have to believe that you can first before you do anything, whether it's telling a story, making a film, whatever. And then you just take it in small pieces. I didn't approach, have you seen Andy? I didn't approach Andy's story like, I'm going to make this film, it's going to be on HBO, and I'm going to win an Emmy. And, you know, it was, I'm going to tell this story, and I'm going to start by picking up the phone and calling Andy's mother and find out what happened that day. And then it was just the next part, and the next part, and the next part. So sort of building on that. But first you have to believe you can. So I'm going to um, share, uh, is it the first tab, Dan, or should I click on the image? Oh, that's OK. I think, hey, here it is. I'm going to try this one. Yeah, I'll do it right here. One sibling's act. Hi, I'm Chris Berg, an actor who happens to have Tau syndrome. You might know me as Quirky from Life Goes On. Are you driving? That's just part of yeah, if you want to just make it big, thank you. Hi, I'm Chris Berg, thank you. an actor who happens to have Tau syndrome. You might know me as Quirky from Life Goes On. That's just part of my story. I think everyone has a great story. Join me in watching this great story about an inspiring person with Down syndrome. Dear Scholastic, in your Scholastic Children's Dictionary book on page 160, the word retarded is used to describe Down syndrome. I have a sister with Down syndrome, and I find that word very offensive. I suggest that you use developmental disability or intellectual disability instead. Thank you. Sincerely, Trent Briggs, age 9. I'm Megan Briggs. Who's my brother Trent? I wanted to learn about Down syndrome when I was a little younger, so I looked in the dictionary and um, I looked at the definition of Down syndrome and I saw the R word or retarded in the definition describing it. I kind of got hurt by that because I don't really like the word because it's considered hate speech. So I told my mom about it. He was pretty upset. He's like, Mom, you know, why is this in a dictionary? He just couldn't believe that it was in there. And I said, Well, you know, when you see things that you don't like, then you need to do something about it and make a change. We emailed Scholastic Dictionary to change the definition. He put together most of it. I helped him with some of the terms and everything, how to, how to do it. And we sent it off, hoping that they would make the change in the dictionary. After a few months, I think, they emailed back and they said they would change it in the next volume. The R word. When someone says the word, it just kind of like you feel it inside of you. It's like a punch almost. I'm probably at an out because I hate that word. I am so proud of him and all the work that he's done in terms of stopping the R word. Is that was just the start of, a start of it, really. And he's always forever defending um, his sister in, in terms of the language that's used and the, the slang. Somebody asked me what Down syndrome is. I always tell them it's just an extra chromosome in your body, and it just makes learning a little more difficult. It's a lot of fun to be her brother because we have a lot of good times. She's just like anyone else. She she can do anything. Sometimes we'll go in the pool and we'll just be in there for hours and just laughing, and we'll have such a good time. She can dance. She can do any of that stuff. Well, Trent, he's crazy, of course. He's fun. 
place where we can connect to our family. I think it's just a special connection we have that some siblings don't have. I'm gonna be happy. I love that they're there for each other. And as a mom, when you think about as they get older and as, as my husband and I get older and eventually aren't there for them anymore, I know that they're gonna be there for each other. When we're growing up, I think when we're brother and sister, it won't really change. We'll still love each other. I just think that we'll get along even be better because we'll just love each other that much more. <laughs> I'm so happy about that. I'll make it, and this is my great story. You can watch more great stories at ndss.org slash stories. So I wanted to let you folks know as well, those 10 stories, so they're 10 um, stories with uh, three, min three minutes each roughly, and the 10 of them um, cost $5,000 to make over the course of the year. So, and most of that was, so I don't do the, sh the camera work or editing. Um, typically I can, but um, I think that that's what professionals are for. So as a producer director, I produce, direct, and write the scripts and you know, think of the vision, coordinate the shooting, think of the story. So um, that was hiring a, a camera person um, and an editor. And uh, we had a student from Berkeley who did the music for us and then the travel cost. So those were 5,000 to make this project. I'm gonna do one more and then I'm gonna move to some question and answers. Unfortunately, I did not, I, my, I forgot my watch this morning, so I need someone to help me with time, Meryl, um, to let me know. But I'm gonna do one more. I encourage the rest of you, if you get the opportunity and you wanna watch some more, I realized as I was watching some of these that, um, I didn't pull up some of the, you know, uh, ones maybe with some more diversity, but there are, there, they are there, and you can look and explore yourself, and again, um, compare them to the written story. It could be interesting. Um, I'm going to do one more just in light of busting stereotypes. When Gracie, my daughter with Down syndrome, um, was born, or before she was born, actually, I thought having a baby with Down syndrome meant that I was going to have a baby that was not smart and that I was going to have a baby that was not beautiful. And to this day, that makes me a little bit sad because I couldn't have been more wrong. She's incredibly smart and she's incredibly beautiful. Her first language was sign language. We taught her sign language. She started signing at four months old. By the time she was two, two she had over 300 signs. And to this day, I still sign to her. You guys can remember this, if you will. You're beautiful. Go ahead, try it. and smart. And then she finishes, she says, the whole package. <laughs> and I say, that's right. So here you go, here, here's the last one, and then I'm gonna take some Q&A, and then if folks wanna see a trailer of what I'm working on now, we can share that. An actor who happens to have Tau syndrome. You might know me as Corky from Life Goes On. That's just part of my story. I think even when has a great story. Join me in watching this great story about an inspiring person with Down syndrome. Imagine me, Chrissy Bates, competing in a beauty pageant. Well, it is true. It will happen. She was about 16 and a teacher at school gave her an article about a fashion panel at Eastland Mall. Christy brought it home to me and she said, you know, I want to do this. I knew she'd be competing against other people without disabilities and I kept putting her off and she wouldn't let me do that. The day came and she went out and she interviewed and she walked the runway and she competed with all the other girls. And I was a nervous wreck. She was calm, she showed more composure and self-confidence than I ever would have had at her age. She did a wonderful job and she got on the fashion panel. From that, she started doing freeze modeling and some runway modeling. I went to Chicago and um, they did pizzas. Christy shot two composites. We sent those around and she got some jobs and um, kind of just took off from there. 
Christy got uh, information in the mail about a uh, beauty pageant. It was something she wanted to do. And my husband and I have always had just one goal, and that is that Christy have an opportunity to experience everything in life that she wants to do. She got to be a contestant, and um, the rest is kind of history. Here comes Christina Bates. My mom and dad took me in, in, in Chicago. I asked them a thousand people, a thousand people was me. My dad was my, my escort in the evening, putting down competition. I performed in in the dance. I, I won two, two awards. When I first saw expressions on my face, I, I, I like that. <laughs> It was probably the second day of the pageant. I was sitting next to some other parents, and um, a mom said to me, are, are you Christy's mom? And I said, yes. And she said, you know, I said to my husband last night, do you realize there's a girl in the pageant with a disability? And he said, no, I hadn't noticed. And right then I realized that she had blended. She had, was one of the contestants that day, and that was the most wonderful thing, and I think, it may be hard for her to express, but that was what was really wonderful for her, too. She had such a good time. She was just one of the girls doing her best. I would not have believed when she was first born that that was something that was possible. To see her blossom and to become the beautiful young woman she is today, I feel like she, in some respects, had begun to change the look of Down syndrome, that, that people look at it differently and see a girl that's composed and, and can experience many of the things that other people can. She's worked hard to perfect her skills and, and her abilities. I'm Jean Bates. I'm Chrissy Bates, and this is my great story. You can't watch more good. So those are some great stories, and they were about busting stereotypes of um, some of the stereotypes I, I certainly had before Gracie was born, and, um, and I've had a great experience learning from so many other people with disability now. Um, and if you look at some of the other stories, you'll see Dion, who is into computer um, repair and Isaiah, who um, with his mom is, you know, should be having a comedy routine. Um, Jay, who, you know, has his driver's license and drives around. So there are several of those. But I'd like to take some time to do Q and A, um, and then if folks are interested, I can show a short trailer for a film I'm consulting on now, and that film is called Intelligent Lives, and it is questioning the paradigm of intelligence and what makes people smart and um, what makes a life worthwhile. So why don't we take some questions? I'm gonna wait for the microphone. Thank you, Melanie, for your presentation today. Um, there, there's one line you uh, said that uh, got stuck here uh, was I hired an editor and I assume you meant editor, editor for the documentary film. Um, I have a three documentary films on hold for nearly a decade now and the reason for that is money and finding an editor. How did you hire your editor? How did you do that? Well, there's a couple of professional organizations that I would specifically recommend to folks in this community. So if you're interested in any of the different parts of the trade, so from sound person to camera, editing, any number of those, um, there's a couple of really great organizations. There's also organizations that you can join with that you can work with to do fundraising. So for example, there's the Filmmakers Collaborative and there's a Center for Independent Documentary. They're called Fiscal Sponsors. So if you have a project proposal and you want to join with them, you share the proposal with them, they decide whether it's something that they want to partner with you on, and they are a nonprofit, so then you can, you can apply for grants um, with their nonprofit status, 
they take and manage the money for you, and then you know you um, use that money to make your film. But in addition to that process, there's this collegiality you have with other filmmakers who are in that program, and you can you know go online and see other filmmakers now. They're in Filmmakers Collaborative or Center for, Center for Independent Documentary, and certainly through word of mouth, we know about editors, but also college colleges. You know, um, I actually went back to my alma mater and um, was looking for. I had actually. Um, was adjunct faculty um, for a session, and I knew some students there that were really um, enjoying uh, editing. And so, one of the students that graduated, I hired him to be my editor on this project. And so, for the editing, you know, the gathering the material and the pre-production and the production, the research, all that, that takes quite a bit of time. But then the editing can be a very concentrated time. So, I think we edited these in two weeks, maybe three. And then I got a student from Berkeley who wanted to compose the music because he wanted the experience of having that on his portfolio when he went out and, you know, and was selling his trade when he graduated. So I worked with students um, is one way to do it. But also even with editors who may have been out in the field for a while and you know, do have more experience, um, if you find a project that interests them, you know, if there's something that's specific to their interest, they are negotiable on their salary. It can be sort of, you know, um, a variety of ways that you can make things happen. So I would encourage you to, and that's the other reason for an editor, um, when you said you have these projects and they've been sort of sitting there for a while, that's why it's so important to have an editor. I need that objective viewpoint, especially when I've been spending six months, or in Andy's case, seven years, right, in the material, in the, in the, in the footage, in, in looking at it and shooting it and dealing with it. Having an objective voice there to say, yeah, you know, I don't really understand that part. You know, let's, we need to tease that out a little bit more is really helpful, so I very much recommend doing that. But in terms of finding the money, there are grants that you, if you partner with like a filmmakers collaborative or Center for Independent Documentary or even online, I'm sure they have lots of resources now for associated grant makers. And you can start to identify grants that are particular to your project. Or, for example, you know, finding an organization, in this instance, the National Down Syndrome Society, who I knew would want to use these, um, these projects, you know, whether there's people who have an interest in Down syndrome, or there's a great, great book that I recommend called, um, called Shaking the Money Tree. I used that very early um, when I was making films. And, you know, in some ways it, it didn't really help me raise the money as much as it did help me understand how people raise the money. I think I just sort of kept plugging along and making it happen. Thank you very much. I just want to make sure I understood the names. One is National Something and the other is Center Something. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Filmmakers Collaborative yes, is one, yes. and that's in, and that's local. Right. And then the other is um, Center for Independent Documentary, and they're also Massachusetts based. But those are fiscal sponsors. What's called fiscal sponsors for filmmakers. So you can start. I would start there for sure. Thank you. Sure. And I have recommendations too if you need them. Sure. Yeah, yeah. You can feel Thanks. free to reach out. Yeah. Are you guys awake? Don't be shy. Come on. Cat can ask me anything. So, as a filmmaker, one of the things I noticed, you know, audio is always an issue, and you had subjects who aren't always um, as easily understandable as, um, you know, it's people who have to choose whether to put, um, oh my God, captioning or thirds. Yeah. Thank you. Whether to have a little third or captioning. And you chose not to, and I'm really curious about that decision. Yeah. Because watching this, I had to work really hard to engage, and I feel like I missed some things. Yeah. But I also know that by doing that, it sort of implies that you know people can't be understood. That's right. So we did make a very conscious decision about that, and that was you know um, on behalf of the National Down Syndrome Society as well. We decided not to caption people with Down syndrome because we felt like if we captioned people with Down syndrome. We would, cap we would need to caption everybody in the project, and do we want to caption the entire project? And why would we need to caption everybody in the project is the question that you can ask yourself, right? Because we felt like it was ableist. This idea of ableism is that, you know, if you're not able, it's sort of the idea of racism um, applied to disability, so ableism. If you're not able to sort of, um, you know, communicate and articulate clearly, then somehow you need 
uh, uh, supports in order to be in society. Now, certainly we do need supports as people with disabilities, but in this instance, we felt like because we're celebrating the lives of people with Downs and we're telling their story, we thought it was okay to expect the audience to work a little bit harder to listen to these voices and maybe watch it again and maybe see that, you know, yeah, the intelligibility can be difficult, but there's words there that if you wait a little bit longer, if you try a little bit harder, you might see that there's a bridge there that you hadn't explored. Thanks for that question. Yeah. I'm oh, sorry, right back here, yeah? Thank you very much for your work and congratulations on all your achievements. My question is about, I have two questions. The first is the impact of the stories you have told. Obviously one can, I hypothesize of how people have received your films, but I would love to hear from you if there are certain reactions that you've got, either surprising reactions um, or unexpected reactions from audience members. And the second question is, we're starting to see a tiny bit of change in terms of the portrayal of people with Down syndrome in mainstream media. Of all the disabilities out there, which ones do you think still have not even made it to um, national television? Wow, those are two really interesting questions. So first I would say in terms of the impact of the film, you know, I think you have to think about an impact campaign when you make a film first, right? I was